Hello everyone, today I'm going to talk about the paper Optimal Parallel Algorithms in a Binary Forking Model. As the name suggests, this paper contains two parts, the binary forking model and the new optimal algorithms on this model including sorting, list ranking, and so on. You may ask, why a new model? Don't we have lots of computational models already? Are these new algorithms useful and inspiring, or just tweaking some tricks on a new model? We believe that this model is a good fit for modern multi-core architecture and leading to efficient algorithm in practice, so we'll go into more details in this talk. Starting from 2005, we have the first commodity multi-core CPUs. After 15 years, we now have super powerful multi-core processors and I can have a single shared memory machine with over 100 cores, 200 threads, and tens of terabytes of shared main memory, which is more than sufficient to solve lots of big data problems. And during these 15 years, supported by the development of parallel hardware, we witnessed the fruitful results in shared memory parallel software and implementations. Because of the development in both hardware and parallel algorithms, nowadays even databases and the largest scale graph processing can be done in a shared memory parallel machine and have better performance than on large scale distributed machines or external memories. The flourishing of the tree of parallel computing doesn't come from nothing but is supported by deep solid roots. The theory research of parallel computing started way earlier, dated back to at least the 70s. Among these theory results, mostly done by our community, the most impactful ones are the numerous PRAM algorithms based on the PRAM models. Actually, a considerable fraction of the fruits on top of the tree use or borrow ideas from PRAM algorithms proposed in the last century. But after we have the trunk, branches, and fruits today, it's also the time for us to revisit. Is PRAM still the best model for us to design and analyze algorithms today? Our answer is probably not, because PRAMs make the assumption that the processors run in lockstep, which is different from today's parallel machine. So processors on the PRAMs are highly synchronous. However, the reality is that modern architecture is highly asynchronous. The threads in your computer do not run in lockstep, and they have their own steps. Many factors contribute to the varied processor rates, like cache effects, processor pipelines, hyperthreading, branch prediction, and many others. The so threads are asynchronous, and unfortunately, the cost to globally synchronize them can be overwhelming. To show how expensive it can be, I actually run a small experiments. I run a billion arithmetic operations in parallel, and in, be in between, I add some global synchronization. And as you can see, when the synchronization round exists about 100, the overhead starts to dominate. This overhead can be significant in practice, even we only synchronize for log n or log square n rounds. There were different attempts to fix the PRAM model basically by giving synchronization a higher weight, but a widely adopted solution is to not to consider synchronization as a primitive which is the modest threaded model that reflects the real architecture of a shared memory parallel machine better. I should mention here is that it is actually a class of models that are widely used in design and analyze recent algorithms. And this is a very short list, like not including my own papers. One specific model is the parallel model in CRIS, Introduction to Algorithms, and I will first describe it as an example. A multi-threaded models have multiple threads as the name suggests. Each is similar to a RAM that can execute instructions or access a shared memory sequentially. In addition, a fork instruction creates two subtasks that can be run in parallel, and of course you can do it recursively. And after both subtasks finish, they join back and continue executing. The CLRS version assumes race free that this allows the parallel instructions to access the same memory location in a certain way like this. Alternatively, many algorithms use test and set, compare and swap, and fetch and add to access the same memory location atomically. An algorithm on this model is measured by work W, which is the total number of the nodes in the stack, and span or depth D, which is the longest dependence chain. So this model doesn't have a name, so let's first call it the binary fork join model. Binary is due to binary forking, and we have fork and join in this model, so in total it's the binary fork join model. 
algorithms designed under this model can be directly implemented using many of the existing libraries. And more importantly, we have good theoretical guarantee when mapping such a computation to hardware. Using randomized work stealing scheduler and under mild assumptions, the computation can be dynamically scheduled on the modern hardware, and the only overhead is to uh, occur no more than order of PD steals with high probability between two processors. The computation on this model is highly asynchronous. The entire execution is decentralized, each thread works on its own, or only coordinate when going to the schedulers or a, and talking to another thread with no more than order of PD times. The entire execution uses no global synchronization at all since it is expensive in practice. As I mentioned, there are many variants of this model based on a few decisions, like whether the forking is binary or arbitrary, nested or non-nested join, race-free or assuming some atomic operations. In total, there are lots of variants. Sometimes they cause confusions or even mistakes. It also makes the comparison of the algorithms complicated. So after the idea was proposed by about two decades, we believe it's a good time to revisit. In this paper, we, we investigate the decisions and introduce the base model, which is the... In the binary forking model, we made two decisions. First, fork creates two subtasks. And second, we also assume that weakest atomic operation, test and set, that tries to atomically set a bit flag from 0 to 1 and returns true only when it is successfully does so. Test and set is the weakest consensus primitive, and in Hurley Heath's notation, it has the consensus number to be 2, meaning that only two processors can reach consensus via test and set. We know that once test and set is allowed, it can be used to implement join. For join node, we can initialize a flag to be 0, then the first subtask finishes will try to test and set and succeed, and the second one comes, fails the test and set, knows the other task has finished, and continues the computation after the join. We no longer need join, so this model is the binary forking model. Now let's talk about why we consider it as the base model. Question 1, why binary when forking? One reason is that in practice, that's how most existing software is implemented. But more importantly, if you allow arbitrary forking with unit costs, then any PRAM algorithm will fit in this model with the same bounds because again, we assume unit cost global synchronization. Another key reason is that the most efficient existing scheduling results for work stealing hold only for binary forking, including the order of PD steal guarantee we have just mentioned. You can use binary forking for log n rounds to simulate binary forking, but the spam bound will increase by the factor of log n. In conclusion, due to theoretical and practical reasons, we only allow forking to be binary. The second question, is nested join necessary? If joins are nested, each join joins the two corresponding tasks by a fork. One reason is that this is easy to implement. Existing libraries usually have the built-in construct, like silk spawn, silk sync, or some lambda expression. But what if we don't nest them? Actually, it doesn't matter. Existing scheduling results for work stealing do not require a nested join. So compared to binary forking, nested join is an option, not a requirement. We can use test and set to implement a join that does not correspond to a fork. This means that the binary forking model allows non-nested join. And the last question, why test and set? Recall that the test and set is the weakest consensus primitive. In a join, two threads need to reach consensus, so it requires at least test and set. So here from a practical point of view, we do not make stronger assumptions for real hardware as compared to the basic binary fork join model. Namely, any machine support the binary fork join models also support the binary forking model. And of course, real architecture does support test and set. And as a wrap up, in the binary forking model, fork is binary. It's assumed test and set, and we can use it to implement join and non nested join. All existing theoretical guarantees still hold. This is our base model that extends the basic binary fork join model. It's more general, but makes no more assumptions for hardware. But we also considered two common derived models. One is definitely the binary forking model that assumes join instead of test and set as a primitive and has additional guarantees for race-free and determinism. And of course, we can make stronger assumptions for the con consensus primitives, such as compare and swap. Many existing algorithms are based on these two models.
In this model, we'll mostly focus on the binary forking model and discuss why we made these decisions. Remember that our overall goal is to design algorithms that are highly asynchronous. Now let's talk about efficient algorithms on top of the model. I should point out that some algorithms proposed on the PRAM are already optimal, but clearly not all. On the binary forking model, if an algorithm has at least linear work, then the span is lower bounded by order of log n because we need at least log n levels of forking to generate n parallel tasks. Meanwhile, a parallel fourth of size n already has log n span, so we cannot use them as often as on the PRAM model. Some existing algorithms are already optimal in the binary forking model for simple problems like reduce scan filter, but not even for sorting. For example, Cole's ingenious PRAM merge sort runs in rounds and requires log n rounds, so the span in the binary forking model is log n, uh, order of log squared n, the same as the normal merge sort. That's probably why in practice we usually use the faster asynchronous sample sort that has lower span on the binary forking model. In this paper, we provided a list of novel optimal algorithms on the binary for, uh, in the binary forking model. Some are randomized. An optimal algorithm must achieve order of log n span, so it's highly asynchronous and only use none or constant number of global synchronization. We are a bit surprised of the non-existence of optimal asynchronous algorithms for these fundamental problems. Meanwhile, these algorithms are all quite simple. And due to time limit, uh, I will only discuss list contraction algorithm, which is part of list ranking, uh, one of the most useful uh, parallel algorithms in practice. Like in synthesis of parallel algorithms, list ranking is discussed in the second and the third sections. We know that prefix sum is like the backbone of parallel algorithms. List ranking does the same as prefix sum, but assumes input as a linked list. Every node only knows the previous and the next node, but not any global information. It's a, bit, it's a bit hard to read in this way, so let's draw it like that. This ranking computes the prefix sum, and is widely used in graph, tree, and sequence algorithms when you only have local information. Usually we add two dummy nodes at both ends for simplicity, and most existing algorithms rely on the splice operation that picks a node, add its value to the next node, and remove it from the list. Splice can be applied in parallel like this, but no two consecutive nodes can be processed together. And we can process the next and the next until the list is empty. And this step is called list contraction, which uses the splice operation to contract the list and generate a tree with shallow depth. Then we can propagate the values back. Since the tree is shallow, this step, referred to as the reconstruction, is trivial. The study of list ranking is mostly on the list contraction part. Given its importance, list contraction has been studied for decades. Even on a PRAM that allows free synchronization, the existing ones are either complicated or not theoretically efficient. More importantly, all existing algorithms runs in rounds and requires at least log in rounds of global synchronization. But when we teach a parallel algorithm course, this is an algorithm that's going to be covered in the first two weeks, or at least that's the case for my course. So our goal is to find a simple list contraction algorithm that is both theoretically and practically efficient and preferably using no global synchronization. Our new algorithm is motivated by our previous algorithm that is conceptually simple and practically efficient. The high level idea is to use priority to decide the order of splices, which is drawn at the beginning. And the two dummy nodes have the highest priority. So from now on, numbers in the boxes are always priority. So if a node's priority is smaller than its two neighbors like that, then we can splice it out, and we can apply it to all nodes in one round. And then it's easy to check that no two consecutive nodes can be spliced out together. And we can do it again, then again, until the list is empty. Conceptually, this algorithm is very simple. We give a random priority to each node, and we contract all feasible nodes in rounds and pack the rest of the nodes to guarantee work efficiency until the list is empty. We can get the dependencies between the splices by linking the nodes, and this algorithm is run by repeatedly taking out all leaves in rounds. It's shown that the tree height is theta of log n without probability. This algorithm is very fast in practice, but it still has the disadvantage that it runs in rounds and needs synchronization between rounds and the overhead of packing in each round. Let's see if we can do better. Our key insight is that splices don't have to be synchronized. 
So we don't really need these four splices in one round to finish simultaneously. Then I say I actually run a parallel four on these splices, and in the middle, some may have finished, some in progress, and some may not even start. Note that once splices for what node one and two are finished, then we can process node five, and we don't really need to wait nodes zero and three. Recall that the dependencies of the splices are like that. Node five only relies on node one and two, but not zero and three. Those are the false dependencies in the RAM-based algorithm. The high level idea in this new algorithm is to notify the parent node once a splice finishes, and check if the parent node can be spliced. And by doing so, we can get a very simple algorithm. We give a flag of each node based on how many subtrees they have, which can be checked locally. Then we make a parallel for to process each leaf node with flag two. Each node start to contract asynchronously. Let's say node two finishes the earliest. Uh, it then finds its parents, which is five in the figure and this line in the pseudocode. It runs a uh, test and set. In this case, it will succeed and quit. Let's say zero finishes the next. It splice out and find its parents. And this time the test and set will fail because the flag is one. So zero, take over four and continues. And it will then test and set node seven, succeed and quit. Here node one finishes, fail the test and set and take over five. Node three finishes, wins the test and set and quit. And then the last node will continue and finish all splices on this path. That's the whole algorithm. It doesn't rely on another algorithm like packing and requires no synchronization at all. And it's easy to check that the work is linear because every time you go into this loop, one node is spliced out and we can only come to here at n times. And I should emphasize that this is the worst case bound, not in expectation or with high probability. The span bound is order of log n with high probability because log because parallel four contributes log n, and every time we iterate in the while loop, we climb up one level and we know the tree height is order of log n with high probability, which gives the overall span bound. And that's it. That's the entire analysis. Since the code is so simple, I actually implemented it for fun, not part of this paper. It's within 20 lines, definitely an algorithm we can teach even in an undergrad course. We compare it to the already efficient code from the previous paper, and you can see a significant improvement on running time, basically from two aspects. First, we save the synchronization cost, which is more for smaller input, and we also save the round-based packing cost, which is about a constant 30% for all cases. As a conclusion here for this contraction, we propose an extremely simple parallel algorithms for uh, both conceptually and practically, based on using test and set smartly. It's efficient both theoretically and practically. It's highly asynchronous. Actually, it does not use any synchronization. To me, this is a very interesting result since this ranking is like a headache in teaching a parallel algorithm course, and now we have a good candidate. But the more crucial question is, what can we learn from it, and why it's so simple? Parallel algorithms are harder than sequential algorithms because we have dependencies between operations. In a classic way, when we design algorithms, we can use divide and conquer that breaks into the computation into non-dependent part, or run in rounds for all nodes with no forward dependencies, similar to a topological sort. But what if we directly convert the dependent structure to the de computational DAG? From the algorithmic side, an algorithm only needs to denote the fork and join points, and that's it. And the rest of the work is done by the work stealing scheduler. It works for any dependent structure that has constant fan in per node using test and set for join. By doing so, we got super simple algorithms for a long list of problems, and in many cases, they incur no overhead, such as synchronization and packing the leftover elements. And we can even get worst case bound on randomized algorithms. Meanwhile, this idea solves long standing open problems for decades, such as incremental Delaunay triangulation and convex hall, and we put them in separate paper due to space limitation but they all share the same high-level idea. Our follow-up paper in SPA this year on convex hall also introduces a heavy weapon with involved theory in abstracting and generally analyzing for this type of algorithms. In a bigger picture, we have these theoretical innovations in the literature for quite a while, although we still don't have the simple and efficient parallel algorithms for many problems. The work stealing scheduler, which is a key research progress in our community over the past decades, provides a simple solution to convert a computational DAC 
into real uh, parallel execution. The relationship between configuration space and dependent structure have been studied extensively as well. In this paper, we show that in many cases, we can directly convert a dependent structure to a computational DAC. To do so, we need to uh, formally define computational model on what we can do and what we cannot. We know that algorithms like convex hall and Delaunay triangulations are not hard sequentially, not to mention Knuth shuffle or list ranking. Sequentially, they also work efficient. By combining the analysis of dependent structure, we can show good parallelism for these algorithms. Then, in this paper, we directly convert them to algorithms so they remain simple and are efficient because of no overhead due to parallelism. Finally, combining with the work steering scheduler, we can get good practical performance. The algorithmic merit of this paper bridges the analysis tools on the left-hand side and the practical tools on the right-hand side to get desired algorithms that are simple and efficient, and this bridge put all pieces together which we believe might even change the landscape to consider parallel algorithms and asynchronous computing. In this paper, we also have other algorithms on sorting and order set operations. Uh, we have also formally discussed complexity results, and you can go to the full version of this talk for more details. Finally, let's have a short wrap-up. Modern parallel machines are highly asynchronous, meaning that global synchronization is costly and should be avoided if possible. To capture that, we revisited the existing multi-threaded models, give out our suggestions, which is the binary forking model, and explain the decisions. Formalizing the model can be helpful in guaranteeing correctness when applying scheduling theorems and comparing different algorithms. Then we show a list of new optimal algorithms for fundamental problems like sorting and list ranking, and they don't need synchronization. First, we are surprised that such algorithm didn't exist before, and secondly, although the analysis in this paper is challenging theoretically, it turns out that the new algorithms are also su surprisingly simple, even compared to PRAM algorithms that allows free synchronization. Our algorithms are inspired by several novel algorithmic insights, which have merits beyond a single paper and led to many very interesting follow-up work by us and others already. I believe that this can be a huge number of future works related to complexity, algorithms, and implementations on exploring asynchrony in parallel algorithm design. And we're currently working on some of them, and we're more than happy to discuss with you more at SPA. Thanks for listening.